Um, it gives me great pleasure to introduce the third session of our conference, St Strategic Planning to Improve Surgical Obstetric Anesthesia and Trauma Care in the Asia Pacific. Uh, Dr. Key Park and our last session gave a recap of the first. So I'll just very briefly recap the second in the series, which was around financing for this care. We had an introduction by Dr. Jim Kim, followed by an excellent outline of, macro, of the macroeconomics of global surgery by Dr. Blake Alkaya, after which I finally began to understand the modelling that was used by the Lancet Commission to arrive at the figure of 12.3 trillion by 2030 with that additional investment in surgical care. Dr. Rifut Atun from Global Health Systems Harvard then discussed mechanisms for creating fiscal space. And Dr. Peter Cowley from WHO described just how challenging this is in the context of the current revenue shock that we're experiencing, where we're seeing negative GDP growth of up to 6.6% in the Pacific, negative 6.6%. We had some great discussion and questions from participants with people pointing out the fragmented development landscape that leads to so much inefficiency and is counter to all our goals. There was comment around the critical role of the private sector as countries are scaling back rapidly and also the size and potential of the philanthropic market. Dr. Alkaya had the final word on the elephant in the room, which we all know, which is that health system strengthening is unbelievably hard. And while it's a current buzz phrase, when it comes down to it, there are very few donors, either NGO or governments, who have the patience to meaningfully invest in health system strengthening. The SOA community has had our lack of cohesion pointed out to us, and this session, Strategic Partnerships in Supporting Surgical Care, will look at how we can do better in this domain. And to moderate, I'd like to introduce Professor David Waters and Professor Adrian Gelb, who are already known to so many of you. Professor Waters is the Alfred Deakin Professor of Surgery at Deakin University in Bowen Health in Victoria, uh, Australia, and the past president of the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons. Mm -hmm. Professor Emeritus Gelb, is previous vice chair of the Department of Anesthesiology and Perioperative Care at UCSF and the current president of the World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists. Thank you, gentlemen, over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Liz, for that uh, introduction and summary of the uh, previous events. Um, I'm delighted to be co-chairing along with uh, David and we look forward to a very animated and productive discussion after the uh, presentations. Uh, we're going to start off with four uh, framing presentations to uh, lay some of the initial groundwork before we move on to hearing from a variety of uh, partner organizations. The uh, first presentation comes from somebody that uh, hardly needs an introduction from us, and that's Dr. Paul Farmer, who will be speaking to us about equitable collaboration in surgical care. Uh, he's the chair of the Department of Global Health and Social Medicine at Harvard Medical School and the co-founder of Partners in Health and has been an inspiration and leader in this field. Uh, let's uh, hear and see what Paul has to say. Hi, my name is Paul Farmer, and it's my privilege to welcome you to a critically important meeting, a strategic planning meeting in which you consider how best to improve quality of and access to surgical obstetric anesthesia and trauma care in the vast Asia Pacific region. The meeting was sponsored by my <coughs> colleagues from the Program in Global Surgery and Social Change. And I know from them about the great work you've already done in developing National Surgical Obstetric and Anesthesia Plans, or NSOPs. In addition to generating new acronyms, I also hear my SOA colleagues using terms from international policy and development work, terms like stakeholders. But I encourage you today to become more than stakeholders. You need to become stake planters to stake your claim to increased access for quality surgical obstetric and anesthesia and trauma care. This work will require two things beyond your professional competence, which you already have. It will require 
a real commitment to forging novel partnerships, partnerships that must be forged outside of the operating room or clinic. It will require a real commitment to patient accompaniment of others. And those others are not only policymakers and planners or government authorities, they're also to be found in the communities excluded from modern surgical care and thus expert mercy. We're counting on you to make this work count. The stakes, as you know, are high. We need you in this fight and always have. Thank you and may your work prove fruitful. What a thrilling beginning with a uh, challenge uh, right off uh, the bat. Uh, to use both a cricket or a baseball phrase uh, to get us going. Our uh, second framing presentation uh, is going to be done by Dr. Terry Reynolds. Uh, Terry is going to talk about collaboration across the spectrum of care, emergency, trauma, and surgical care. And Terry is the unit head of the clinical services and systems, the integrated health services at the World Health Organization. Over to you, Terry. Thanks very much, Adrian, um, and good morning, afternoon, evening to those around the world. It's really nice to see your faces. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity to join you. I want to just focus on a couple of quick areas in terms of kinds of partnerships. The, the term partnerships and strategic partnerships can encompass a range of different activities, and all of you have worked with many of those. I want to introduce one higher level systems idea that we're working with a lot at WHO right now. Um, and then also just give a couple of very concrete examples of how specific kinds of partnerships have functioned to advance some of the ideas that you're talking about. Um, the first is to mention, you know, right now there are two very dominant uh, narratives in health in the world. Um, one of those is COVID. And another one of those is something called PHC for UHC, so primary health care for universal health coverage. And people often have a question about how surgery fits into that. So PHC is a much broader thing, primary health care, much broader than primary care itself. Primary health care is a whole of system approach to putting all of your resources where they need to be to serve people's needs um, with primary care at the center. Now, obviously, operating theater-based surgery is not clinic-based primary care. However, um, the way that we look at this is that you need to strategically position your emergency, critical, and operative services, including your surgery and anesthesia services. You need to strategically position those in an ecosystem, emergency, critical, operative, nice little acronym, ecosystem, um, around the primary care services at the center, around the prevented and promotive longitudinal services at the center. Um, but only with that surrounding and supportive ecosystem can uh, primary care be truly effective. So certain services have to be delivered linked to hospitals in order to be safe. Many services are specifically linked to the peculiar and extraordinary space of the operating theater that can only be delivered there. So it's always a combination of these two things, broadening the health system-based approach to these conditions, broadening what you mean by surgical care, surgical health care phrases that are used, um, and yet maintaining the specificity of these services delivered within an operating theater, which have their own very particular needs for human capacity, material resources, et cetera. So one of the things is this concept, kind of a unifying concept of an ecosystem. We acknowledge these differences from promotive and preventive care and um, understand more clearly their distinct and complementary relationships and their, their equal necessity to do creating a health system that is responsive to people's needs. So what this term allows us is the idea of these other services, emergency critical operative services, including the mechanisms that link them to clinic-based primary care. And that includes mechanisms of transportation, mechanisms of communication, um, protocolized technologies like referral and counter-referral. Um, so I, we found this concept to be very helpful as policymakers look to take a true PHC for UHC approach. 
That's the big thing. Then, and this becomes increasingly important as we've seen in a, in a pandemic context, for example, where there's suddenly a lot of focus on critical care. At other times, there has been a lot of focus on, say, care for injury when the emergency at hand was a different kind. Um, so that's one very important thing. These, and then the way that countries draw the boundaries between emergency and surgical care or critical and anesthesia care or emergency and critical care, these are the, where those boundaries lie for a given country is very, very different around the world. So this integrated approach, however, all of these have a relationship to each other that is in some ways distinct from clinic-based promotive care. So we have found it to be very helpful to address these things together, the idea of an ecosystem. Um, the second thing is just to say we've had extraordinary successes with working with a range of partners, including NGOs, um, collaborating centers, in a, you know, other universities. And believe me, you know, I believe deeply in WHO and what it has to offer, but we know quite well WHO does not do everything. And so these strategic partners have been extraordinarily important. And that includes things, for example, um, like global professional societies that are able to utilize WHO normative materials and create credentialing cascades around such things as capacity building activities. So I will leave it at that. I'm happy to answer any questions um, around any of these. And of course, I, others of you will talk about this, but the other big piece of the puzzle for strategic partnerships is linking up to very well established global health um, uh, global health uh, agendas, such as maternal child health, injury, road safety, being the obvious ones that are very visible and where the link to surgical care is absolutely obvious. So I thank you for your time and uh, please let me know if what I can do to support your efforts and if there are any other questions. Terry, thanks very much for uh, showing us where we fit in some of the strategic thinking and, and uh, the importance of the integration and how we frame our message. And I particularly want to thank you because as I understand it, it's 2 a.m. in Geneva and uh, you're probably the person uh, suffering, 3 a.m., uh, you're the person suffering the most uh, uh, by being here. So we really appreciate it. I think with all the speakers we've got, we shouldn't stop for any questions at the moment. And I'd like to just move on now to our third framing talk, which is from Berlin Kafoa, who is the team leader for the clinical services program and in the public health division of the Pacific community. And Berlin is uh, in Suva, I'm sure. And uh, Berlin, uh, we welcome you uh, to speak to us. Thank you prof for the opportunity to address the forum and uh, i think i'll just uh, i'll speak to our experiences in the pacific island countries i think we've been very fortunate that we've had uh, good leadership over the over many years and we have people like uh, lord tangi kiki minister wanga debbie uh, Sorensen from new zealand who've steadied the ship and provided us guidance over the years. So one of the things that we've been successful is well, we have good leaders who have sustained and guided us over many years. The second is we've been lucky and fortunate to have good partners and meaning the College of Surgeons, the College of Obstetricians, uh, Australasian societies and like anesthesia, who again over many years have helped our clinicians uh, uh, progress with their capacity develop development. And now we are, of course, we have WHO, Harvard, our own academic institutions in FNU and University of Papua New Guinea, and of course, Interplast, who, who, who partner with the Pacific uh, over plastic surgery. So key to the regional activities has been both this leadership that has been there for years, key partners who worked closely over many years and um, who help us then present and advocate at the key forums, meaning at the regional forums like the Pacific Health Ministers meeting, the regional coordinating meeting for WHO. And with all these partners and leaders, we've been collectively been able to bring to attention um, uh, to the world in the World Health Assembly and the Safe Surgery Course. 
And so I think when all of this work is put together, then we come to my third point, when the countries, because of these meetings, will hold us uh, accountable to the, the, the proposals that we brought to their table. So the, we feel obliged and the partners, I've asked the partners to then, then when the NSOPS is completed by partners, one, we get to stage one, we help them complete NSOPS. But that's the beginning of the next stage, which is a bit more complex. That's helping them implement the NSOPS itself. So while we ask for countries to give their time and plan for the NSOPS, I plead to all the partners in this forum, please don't shy away when the countries come back to us and ask us now that we've got the plan, can you help us implement this plan? Uh, and then otherwise it's going to be a World Health Assembly resolution, RCM endorsed, ministers endorsed, but when it comes to the core of it where we implement it in countries, the countries will, uh, will certainly ask the question, especially for those of us in the, in the, in the Pacific Islands. And so what, Berlin? Now we've got it. Can you help us implement it? So I leave you with those, just those key three thoughts, leadership and advocacy and key partners. And lastly, please don't just leave the plan there when it's completed. Uh, put your hand up to help in whatever way you, way you can. I do find that the regional forums or the international forums when partners start to worry about uh, recognition, they forget the very objective of the meeting, which is safe surgery and what your, what your organization can bring to the table, knowing your own comparative advantages. When they start to play for, uh, or give, try to gain attention from their own organization, that's where we, I think, sometimes lose the plot. Thank you, that's the brief from, from me, at, uh, and thank you for the opportunity. Berlin, thank you very much, and I'd like to congratulate you and all the, the local leaders who've really been driving the agenda in the past few years. Uh, we're about to hear from Annette Hollian, uh, who is going to talk about the role of a professional society in supporting uh, you in your aspirations. And I can assure you that later in the program, we're going to hear from a number of people who are willing to put their hands up and want to support you with these NSOPs. And it would indeed be a tragedy uh, if we're not all there uh, with you uh, in, in the work. But uh, Annette Hollian is a current RACS counselor. Uh, she's also been the chair of uh, RACS Global Health for a number of years. And uh, Annette is also the president-elect of the Australian Orthopaedic Association with considerable experience, not only of orthopaedics and children's uh, surgery, but also uh, in disaster situations. Annette, you're very welcome to give your framing talk. Our approach in the region is to operate with respect for each other, walking side by side and hand in hand with our neighbours, exchanging our knowledge skills and ideas for the benefit of our communities. And there. Um, I don't seem to have control. If we could advance the slide, please. We have, uh, we are a little bit different to how training is provided in um, the US and a lot of Europe. So I just wanted to speak um, briefly on that. We have one college across two countries uh, with our nine surgical specialties covered and principally around providing good governance on education, professional standards and advocacy in surgery. And Global Health crosses all three pillars. RACS has one exam that confers a FRAX in each specialty across the two nations. Next slide, please. These, um, we have specific strategies that um, are not mainstream in terms of a technical expertise, but they're very important to our practice as surgeons. And these um, strategies can be found on our website. I don't have time to speak to them now, um, but they also underpin all the work that we do with our partners offshore. Next slide, please. We have 10 defined competencies that every surgeon should have, and only one is technical expertise. We've added the 10th recently, and that's cultural competency and cultural safety. 
And we feel this is really important in our addressing the individual health needs of our patients relative to their culture. And again, that's incredibly important with any interactions that we're having with our colleagues offshore. Next slide, please. Our funding is principally from our government through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade and through donations to the Foundation for Surgery. But all the work that is done offshore is pro bono by fellows from our college and our other professional colleges that we collaborate with quite extensively. Mostly we were supporting service delivery and training, providing short courses, and as surgical skills increased, providing equipment to help those um, elevated levels of care, such as operating microscopes for ENT. We've got a quite a significant scholarship funding and the man on the left is uh, Godfrey Mugati, who was our first row and next scholar from Zim, he's from Zimbabwe now, I'm not sure if that's his origin, um, but he's now the president of COSEXA. And the lady on the right is Fane Lord, who's an ENT surgeon from Fiji, who's recently working with us on a women in surgery uh, webinar. Um, next slide, please. Moving forward, we have to move away from the um, simple provision of mostly teaching on the run type surgery and supporting a service, but without a lot of capacity building. So we've got a new initiative in, um, in education and we've been working very closely with our combined colleges to um, provide a coordinated approach to care in the region. Up until uh, the COVID year of 2020, we were having biannual meetings in either Melbourne or Sydney, where all the colleges are based in one of those two cities and coordinating our activities from our perspective, not from the perspective of the Pacific. And so one of the uh, areas that we're moving forward with is with the clinical leads being appointed from individual countries to help um, guide us in that approach. Next slide, please. So our education initiative has really been accelerated by the um, shutdown in our freedom of movement and we've had to enhance our audiovisual facilities to provide synchronous training for us in the rural areas and within Australia we couldn't cross borders for most of last year and equally that improvement in platforms has been able to extend into our efforts in the Pacific again help going forward will largely be through coordination of effort by the clinical leads in country. We've also established a global health section, which will have a hard launch in May, but we're opened up to membership of any for any registered health uh, provider who agrees to our ways of working. Um, and James O'Keefe is our point of contact at the college to help facilitate that. Next slide, please. I think there's more that we could do, um, particularly around governance over training. We have quite extensive involvement through the college through, and all the specialties in curriculum development in helping define selection training regulations and competency-based training with exit exams and uh, added on to that now transition to practice. And we also have much to offer consultant support for lifelong learning in the 10 competencies. Next slide, please. So in summary, we have, um, RAC's governance in education standards and advocacy by fellows of the combined colleges. Our priorities going forward will try and be very much driven by our partners in need um, and as well as the timing of those initiatives. And our initiatives online, I think, will be revolutionary and able to support not only our rural um, trainees in Australia, but um, our contacts in the Pacific as well. And I think there's enormous opportunity for us to contribute further to the both surgical training and lifelong learning. Thank you very much. Much, uh, Annette, and uh, thank you for uh, to the four speakers for the uh, initial framing presentations, which I think uh, should already have uh, provoked you to be thinking of uh, questions, comments, and discussion. And uh, I do remind you that there is a, a Q and A option uh, should be down the bottom of your screen which you can use for posting questions either to specific uh, speakers or in uh, general and similarly you can use the uh, chat function that way. We're going to turn now to uh, having brief presentations from a uh, fairly sizable number of partner organizations 
uh, representing different types of uh, partnerships. And we're going to start off with uh, international organizations, uh, United Nations, UNITA, and uh, the World Bank. Uh, there are going to be two presentations. Uh, the first will be presented by Dr. Mohamed uh, Pate, uh, Director of uh, Global Financing Facility, the GFF, and the second one by Dr. Jeff Ibbotson, the Senior Health Consultant at the United Nations Institute for Training and Research. Thank you to the organizers for allowing me to share my views on such an important topic. While COVID-19 pandemic has exposed weaknesses in our health systems, it has also created important opportunities to reimagine how surgical care can be scaled up sustainably to serve the poorest, most vulnerable populations amid the pandemic and beyond. We must take advantage of investments in pandemic response that have the potential to improve surgical care. For example, sustainable provision of medical oxygen is critical to safe surgery and quality of maternal and newborn care. And the increased attention to infection prevention and control in health facilities can help prevent surgery-related infections. No partner can do this alone. Global health organizations, funding agencies, academic institutions, and the private sector all have a role to play in the strategic planning and implementation of effective quality surgical services. Through the Global Financing Facility, which is a partnership hosted at the World Bank, we are working with partners all around the world to help countries build resilient health systems for better health outcomes for women, children, and adolescents. Through the GFF-led efforts and working with countries on their own country-led platforms, we're supporting country leadership in developing costed national plans which have identified high impact investments and the most critical interventions that are needed to save lives. The process of developing those investments allows us to align with the longer term country health plans and engage with multiple stakeholders from global organizations to civil society and the private sector to bring resources, both financial and technical resources, as well as innovative solutions for the delivery of safe surgery. Strengthening surgical health systems is going to be fundamental to the achievement of the universal health coverage agenda. At the World Bank and the Global Financial Facility, we are proud to work closely with our global and local partners in pursuit of our shared goals. Through universal access to safe, timely and affordable surgery, we can improve health, save lives and promote economic growth. Thank you once again for your invitation. Greetings from Geneva, Switzerland and the United Nations Institute for Training and Research and the Global Surgery Foundation. Today, I'd like to share with you the opportunity for the global surgery community offered through the engagement of the United Nations Institute for Training and Research, UNITAR. Being a small UN agency, UNITAR may not be well known. In the 1960s, a total of 43 member states joined the United Nations. And in 1962, UNITAR was formed by the UN Secretary General's office to help build capacity within these new governments. The mandate to build capacity continues to this day. The mission of UNITAR is to assist countries in developing their capacities through high level learning solutions and services towards achieving the SDGs and Agenda 2030. Now you may ask, what is the link between UNITAR and global surgery? Well, in 2019, after realizing the huge gap in global health represented by global surgery, UNITAR offered to serve as a UN host agency for the new initiative, the Global Surgery Foundation, and began engaging in capacity building in the sector of health. UNITAR's methodology of capacity building overlaps very nicely with the needs within the global surgery sector. We go to learning solutions down to the countries and UN stakeholders to implement country level action to overcome the global challenges. So in global surgery, we want to build capacity within that sector using the global surgery content, reaching all stakeholders, and then a great example of this is through the NSOPs. 
to assist stakeholders in meeting the global surgery challenges of their countries. Now, a great example of this is uh, seen with intensive ENSOAP workshops uh, for government officials. And we were planning to have one uh, in Nepal uh, in the middle of March. Unfortunately, that was uh, postponed by the pandemic, but we're hoping to restart that initiative. And so we can uh, use this methodology and this common platform for these uh, workshops. And we would like to see this service grow so that the UN platform, along with all of its partners, can then serve to facilitate the development of a country's ENSOP and later assist with implementation where possible. UNITAR and the GSF can also serve as a common platform for online courses, leveraging the UN brand and extending reach to maximize uptake and impact on the front lines. An example of this is seen with the TRIC course with the Royal College of Physicians and Surgeons of Canada, which we plan to bring online in the near future. So to close off, UNITAR and the GSF stand committed to serve as a common UN-based platform to upscale the work of all the stakeholders in global surgery, to hasten our progress towards achieving the goals set before us. Thank you very much uh, for both of those presentations, Dr. Mohamed Pateh and uh, Jeff Iverson. And I think we can all see that the, uh, that the consistency of messaging and the, the alignment of our goals across their various sectors. So that is very encouraging. We're now going to hear from four professional organizations uh, about their potential and their actual contributions from Wayne Morris, uh, the president-elect of the World Federation of the Society of Anesthetists, WFSA, from uh, Associate Professor Amanda Hill uh, in Fiji, uh, from the Fiji National University, and from Rebecca Mitchell, uh, both of whom, Amanda and Rebecca, are on the RANSCOG, uh, the Royal Australasian New Zealand uh, College of Obstetrics and Gynecology, their Global Health Committee, and for Tahim, Tam, Tamina Banu, who is the board member for the Global Initiative for Children's Surgery. So we're going to hear from those four professional organizations now. Thanks for inviting me to speak at this virtual meeting. The World Federation of Societies of Anesthesiologists, WFSA, is a unique global network of national societies representing hundreds of thousands of anesthesiologists in 150 countries worldwide. The WFSA works with national societies and other organizations to advocate for anesthesia and surgery, to provide education and training, and to improve patient safety. The WFSA has an official liaison role with the WHO, and we have worked closely with our surgical colleagues to ensure that safe anesthesia and surgery are on the global health agenda. We all know that universal health coverage will only be possible if there is access to safe surgery. We also need to remember that safe surgery is only possible if there is safe anesthesia. In the first virtual meeting of this series, we heard the famous quote that surgery is the neglected stepchild of global public health. My friend Craig McLean in Boston said that if surgery is the neglected stepchild, then anesthesia is his invisible friend. The reality is that anesthesia has a very low profile in many healthcare systems, and we need the help of our surgical colleagues to reinforce the vital role of anesthesia in delivery of surgical care. It is important that anesthesia is recognized as a separate specialty and not an appendage of surgery. Unfortunately, in some countries, we have seen the development of surgical sub subspecialties without accompanying resourcing of anesthesia. We also need to remember that anesthesia plays a vital role in other areas of healthcare, such as pain management and critical care. We do not want inadequate resourcing of anesthesia to be the rate limiting step when it comes to strengthening surgical care. This is not a case of zero sum gain. We need strong anesthesia and we need strong surgery. The WFSA will continue to work with national societies to advocate for universal access to safe anesthesia, but we need your help in two specific areas. First, 
please adopt the WHO WFSA International Standards for a Safe Practice of Anesthesia. These standards have been officially endorsed by the WHO and offer a graded approach to strengthening anesthesia in low resource environments. Second, please ensure that anesthesiologists are at the table during the development of national surgical obstetric and anesthesia plans. Without our input, both anesthesia and surgery will be the losers. To conclude, it is vital that we continue to work collaboratively. Safe anesthesia is a prerequisite for safe surgery. Thank you very much. Good afternoon from Fiji. Thank you for the invitation. I'm grateful for this opportunity to share some thoughts. So forgive me if there is a sense of frustration, but I look forward to some positive strategies to, helping, to, to help those of us involved in women's health to provide better surgical care. Saving mothers' lives occasionally does require superior surgical skills, which many of us obstetricians do not possess. Our main focus is providing maternity care and surgery is a small part of it. However, a difficult cesarean section with an anterior low-lying placenta would be a challenge for anyone just as operating through chronic pelvic inflammatory disease or endometriosis and managing a woman with pelvic pain. I work in the Pacific where cervical cancer is reported to have the highest global prevalence. Radiotherapy is not available. So surgical options for those women presenting with early disease is optimal. However, these surgeries require skills in neuroteric dissection and pelvic, pelvic lymph node clearance. In developed countries, gynae oncologists are highly trained surgeons. We do not have any in the Pacific, not yet. It is not uncommon for us in low resource settings to be reliant on each other's skills. And I'm grateful that I've always had the support of my surgical colleagues and the anesthetists, but I think we can do better. So if we just stay on this slide, last week under the leadership of Dr. Josessa Turangava, Dr. Jamesa Tundravu Dr. and Dr. Rajiv Patel, and with the support of the national stakeholders, the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons and the Harvard Medical School Global Surgery Team, Fiji held our first NSOAP meeting. Governance, workforce, finance, and training were among the main issues discussed at length. Next slide, please, Anusha. In low resource settings such as ours, we need to optimize sharing of skills, equipment and training opportunities. For over a decade now, we've been looking at strategies to make this happen. But often in low resource settings, we are preoccupied with our own discipline-based challenges. And often we find it difficult to look at the bigger picture of strategizing improvements. So your present initiative therefore is most welcomed. The key players in the Pacific would be the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons, who through DFAT grants since the late 1980s have been assisting in improving surgical training through ad hoc support by visiting surgeons through programs such as SKIPS and PIP. However, this has not resulted in sufficient capacity building. With the exit and retirement of senior, more experienced ONGs, skilled shortages have become more apparent. The other key player in the Pacific is the Royal Australia New Zealand College of ONGs with its key mission in training of specialists in women's health and in providing benchmarks for quality care. Ranspark has been very supportive, but again, the training efforts remain ad hoc. Next slide, please. So what would I like to see happen? Some workable, sustainable strategies for low resource settings where collaborative training and sharing of resources optimizes the surgical care of women. In this day of distant and flexible learning, there are opportunities for skills development through online training programs supported by targeted, timely visits by quality trainers. This should be supported by the local development of good quality skills labs, which can encourage individual and group skills development. Providing better surgical care for our ONG patients is a complex problem. We would like you, our high income country colleagues, to work in equal partnership with us, the local leaders in surgery, anesthesia and ONG, to improve the delivery of sustainable quality surgical care within the broader health systems strengthening agenda. Thank you for listening. <laughs>
My name is Dr. Leanne Panisi. I am currently the head of obstetrics and gynae unit at the National Referral Hospital. I came in as a consultant in 2011. We did neonatal death audits, stillbirth audits, and maternal death audits. We have lots and lots of issues, I would say. We have patients being referred to us late, patients dying from all sorts of conditions like PPH, preeclampsia, which could have been prevented. Patients coming to us with very bad complications. We said, we must do something about this because we see there's a need for staffs who are less skilled in obstetrics and gynecology to have some sort of guideline. So my name is Dr. Rebecca Mitchell. I'm a doctor in obstetrics and gynaecology and I was here volunteering in Honiara through the CitySIP program. So when I first came here, I discussed with Dr. Leanne Panissi, the head of the department, and she'd been thinking about the development of some standardised treatment guidelines for a long time. When Rebecca came into the scene, I told her, it's something that I think will not only help us at National Referral Hospital, but also the doctors in the provinces. We had a long discussion and looked at what were the most common issues throughout the Solomon Islands. Then we developed a working group which involved the obstetricians, gynaecologists at the hospital, as well as midwives and registrars. And then we designed you know, what's most appropriate for the Solomon Islands in terms of treatment and made a book. So it's a 200 page A6 book, goes in the pocket of all healthcare workers throughout the Solomons and therefore will help to improve both maternal and child outcomes in the Solomon Islands. The launch of the book has been uh, a really exciting process and this launch would not have happened without the Go Back Give Back grant. So it's very exciting and very useful. Currently a lot of practices in the Solomon Islands has been done in different places in different ways. So we want that care to be standard around the country. We want people to learn this is how we treat preeclampsia, this is how we treat PPH. Through that book, it's a way of us sharing our specialist knowledge to our colleagues in the provinces. And by doing that, we hope to improve the health of the women of this country. Thanks for playing the video and thank you for having me along today as a representative of the Royal Australian and College and New Zealand College of Obstetricians and Gynaecologists. So RANSCOG is a non-for-profit professional organisation dedicated to establishing higher standards of practice uh, in women's health. The, as we've heard from Amanda, the college trains and accredits doctors throughout Australia and New Zealand. And we also provide clinical and technical support uh, for obstetricians and gynecologists in Asia and the Pacific. So the short video essentially showcased a mutually beneficial capacity development program, um, which was delivered as a collaboration between Ranscog, the Solomon Islands Ministry of Health and Medical Services and the Australian government. And I hope it provided a practical example of a strategic partnership in action. Thanks a lot. Hello everyone, greetings from Bangladesh. I represent Global Initiative for Children's Surgery. GIGS is a consortium of providers, institutions and allies from around the globe and from a wide range of both LMICs and HICs personnel involved in children's surgical care. We are inclusive of surgeons, anesthetists, nurses, radiologists, pathologists, health advocate, activists, and advocacy groups, etc. We know that two thirds of the world's children lack access to surgical care. And up to 50% of the people in many countries are children, especially in LMICs. Many countries are now developing NRSAP guidelines, but children's surgery is not included in them. Geeks has developed a optimal resources for children's surgery, which provides guidelines for provision of care at every healthcare level. It is done by 17 subspecialty, sub mostly LMIC chaired working groups, 
and the guidelines are stratified by subspecialty level of health care, primary health care, first, second, and third level hospitals, and the National Children's Hospital. It do, this document delineates the personal equipment, facilities, procedures, training, research, and quality improvement components at all levels of care. Our hope is that these guidelines will serve as the benchmarks for building surgical services through national surgical obstetric anesthesia plans, and that they can serve as tools to advocate for more resources for children's surgery. Thank you to those uh, four presenters for uh, inspirational presentations of what uh, professional organizations have actually managed to achieve in terms of uh, partnerships. We're going to move on to uh, two presentations that view things uh, differently, uh, and these are research institutes. Uh, the first presentation will be by uh, Professor Sejalin Orgoy, head of the WHO Collaborating Center for Emergency and Essential Surgical Care in Mongolia, the Mongolian uh, WHO Collaborating Center. And the second presentation will be by uh, Dr. Nobajit Roy, who is formerly the professor and chief of surgery at Bark Hospital in uh, Mumbai, and is the lead for the WHO Collaborating Center for Research in Surgical Care Delivery in low and middle income countries. Hello, everybody. I want to introduce you today about Mongolian surgical development in the last 10, 20 years. In Mongolia, have quick uh, and quick development for surgery because from 2005, 2006, until today, last 10 years developed much. First, our collaboration and partners was Swiss surgical team from 1999 until today, we worked with Swiss surgical team and Swanson's Family Foundation uh, about uh, um, emergency and essential surgical care with WHO also trained this kind of training. And uh, we worked with uh, Center for Global Health, Utah University, Society American Gastroenterology and Endoscopic Surgery, ASAN Medical Team, and American College of Surgeons and Australian Embassy. Basic of our uh, development was essential and emergency surgical care uh, project with WHO in Mongolia and Swanson Family Foundation and Swiss surgical team. Under uh, this training, we developed laparoscopic surgery in Mongolia and also until today we developed liver transplantation in Mongolia. By the living donor liver transplantation, today Mongolia in the second place on the world, and also one year survival was 93.7. This success connected with our uh, partners developed country, and globalization for surgery is important role played uh, for development, low uh, surgery, low and um, high income, uh, middle income country. Thank you for attention. This is Roy from the WHO Collaborating Center for Research on Surgical Care Delivery in LMICs, Mumbai, India. There are three thematic areas within LMICs that we work on. First is the volume and burden of surgically treatable diseases. Second is the big problem in LMICs, trauma care. We look at quality and outcomes. And the third is cancer care. The theme of the WHO is to take forward the implementation part of the Lancet Commission report on global surgery. We do these through fellowships, training courses, and international collaboration with universities. Trauma, urban trauma is one area of focus. We have our research grants from bilateral grants, Australia, India, and from research councils of Sweden and Norway. We have created 
uh, on the data management and information side, a national trauma registry uh, in the big metropolis. And that is Titco India. On the rural space side, uh, we have a field-based health systems laboratory in a poor state just south of Nepal called Bihar. The work is primarily through our WHO's fellowships in global surgery. And we have our fellows from around India, Kenya, Netherlands, Norway, USA, UK, and Sweden. Our themes have been access to blood in the Bihar population and looking at workforce. The workforce is typically how a surgeon who's catering to half a million people functions and what are the determinants of a, his or her primary surgery, which is cesarean section rate. We have a strong South to South collaboration and uh, the focus is to also assist ministries of health within the Sierra region. We have worked with Bangladesh and Nepal so far as technical partners, mainly through breast cancer care and cervical cancer care. Okay. There are six building blocks for uh, the WHO's NSOPs and Four out of them have been covered by the WHO. We're still working on health financing and health technology assessment is our area of focus besides costs of injury and cancer care. The pillar which is still missing is leadership management and governance, which we hope to work in the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Roy and Dr. Orgoy. Uh, and it's very exciting to see uh, the sort of research and the developments that you're doing in conjunction with both funding and with partners. We're now going to hear two presentations from uh, a Pacific uh, University, Fiji National University, and also from Interplast Australia and New Zealand. Good afternoon. I'm William May, the Dean of the College of Medicine, Nursing and Health Sciences under the Fiji National University. We were established in 1885 and have been in the business of training the health workforce in this part of the region for the last 135 years or more. We began our postgraduate clinical programs and public health programs 23 years ago, training medical students from across the South Pacific, the Northern Pacific region. Although we've been in this business for more than 135 years, the, under, the, uh, the postgraduate programs have been in the uh, development for the last 23 years. And we're still training and need to train more of, of uh, our colleagues from the, uh, the South Pacific region. If we take the last, say, five years, for example, in the last five years, we've trained 128 postgraduate students diploma uh, graduates making up 55% and the master's program 45% by gender 41% are female out of this 128 and males were 59%. So by country, Fiji being host has trained 71% out of these total postgraduate graduates in the last uh, five years and 29%. The graduates reflect the, uh, the intake and the enrollment we have. We enroll between 20 to 30% of our students from the region, both in the undergraduate and postgraduate programs. So by specialty, when you look at surgery, anesthesia, obstetrics, and gynecology, it's quite evenly spread. 31% of our graduates were from surgery, the, the trainers, the support for capacity building in country, and to enhance the, the programs that we currently uh, run, we will need external support from the colleges in Australia and New Zealand, and we've been doing that for the last 20 plus years as well. Uh, that's our major challenge, and sustaining the current workforce in the institution to be able to deliver training. Right now, one of the issues is recruitment and retention. And what are the other challenges? The other challenges is the ability to deliver in country. This is gonna be the best model for the region. We haven't been able to do that well. We do that in the final years of the program. We would like to do more of those because when we pull students out from their countries, we leave a vacuum. So we should be able to 
deliver those in country, but that is dependent on support for in country supervision and in in country um, you know mechanism to try and ensure that whatever we are offering here in Fiji is of the same standard as what out there in the region. So that's one of our biggest challenges, and it's, it's a good topic to discuss uh, in this meeting. So I look forward to the rest of the speakers, and I'm keen to uh, be here as an institution and as a partner to be supported and to learn and to see how what we can do together to take the training of uh, a, a surgery, anesthesia, obstetric workforce, and of course, other health workforce in the region to the next level. Thank you very much. Thank you for asking Interplast Australia and New Zealand to participate in this very important series of discussions. I'm Dr. Michael McGlynn, a plastic and reconstructive surgeon and the president of Interplast Australia and New Zealand. The organisation was established 38 years ago in 1983 by the Royal Australasian College of Surgeons in partnership with Rotary. It's a not-for-profit organisation that exists on donations, grants and the services of over, three, of over 400 volunteers. It sends more than 40 teams a year of fully trained volunteer plastic and reconstructive surgeons, anaesthetists, nurses and allied health professionals to 17 countries in the Asia Pacific. We do this in partnership with local organisations, including governments, health services, hospitals, universities and NGOs. Our purpose is to rebuild bodies and lives. And we do this by providing surgical services to those who are unable to access them and education and mentoring for local clinicians to enhance local services. In the last year before the COVID crisis, two thirds of our work was purely training and mentoring. Physical disability and deformity caused by birth defect, trauma, burns, cancer, and disease are common causes of poverty and social inequity. Most can be relatively simply alleviated with appropriate surgical intervention. Since the onset of the COVID crisis, Interplast has been unable to provide the usual on-site support. We pivoted to provide an internet-based system of support. In the last year, Interplast has run over 40 webinar sessions for more than 2,500 clinicians, as well as multiple single-site Zoom meetings and case conferences and one-on-one -on -one mentoring support meetings. We're keen to strengthen our ties with existing partners and establish new partnerships. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, those uh, informative uh, presentations. And in fact, that uh, also uh, provoke uh, a, a couple of uh, interesting questions for discussion. The uh, next uh, presentations we've labeled supporting organizations. Um, and we have uh, two speakers, uh, Dr. Annie Chung, uh, Commissioner on the Lancet Commission on Diagnostics and uh, Dr. Richard Henke, who is a professor in the Department of Nurse Anesthesia at the University of Pittsburgh, uh, who will be speaking about coordinated nurse anesthesia educations through the health volunteers overseas in Belize, Cambodia, Laos, and Bhutan. Hi, in the next two minutes, I'm going to highlight the pivotal role of pathology in laboratory medicine. It is known that there exists geographic variation in incidence, mortality and morbidity of various diseases related to capacity to prevent, detect at early stage, accurate diagnosis, effective therapy and monitoring. This figure on childhood cancer serves a good illustration. Many examples can be quoted. For example, the highly preventable cervical cancer. One of the major hurdles is the lack of access to medical diagnostic in many places, particularly low and middle income countries. There is tremendous advances in pathology, particularly genetic diagnosis and artificial intelligence in the last century, but the availability varies in different geographic populations, sometimes within the same country. In the affluent populations, there is increased or even routine application of genetic pathology in diagnosis and management of diseases. 
In some places, even reliable cross-matching and blood bank service may be lacking. Hence, policymakers, health management leaders and donors need to bear in mind that the very specialties of pathology and laboratory medicine is important in prevention, early detection, accurate diagnosis, effective therapy and monitoring of diseases. Adequate resources allocation is crucial. Involvement of pathologists should be reflected at various levels of planning. For example, hospital service plan, government steering committing to prevent diseases, uh, for example, um, cancer expert working group on cancer prevention and screening, professional bodies position statement and good practice guidelines, charity support on medical tests in LMIC. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me to speak about the nurse anesthesia program supported by health volunteers overseas in Cambodia, Bhutan, and Laos. The networks used to educate the nurse anesthetist at Anchor Hospital in Siem Reap include not only HVO volunteers, but also anesthetists in the departments of anesthesiology at the National Pediatric Hospital in Phnom Penh and Siri Raj Hospital in Bangkok. WFSA supported the training of an anchor anesthetist through the BARTC program at Siri Raj. Team performance simulation sessions have been supported by Siri Raj faculty and University of Pittsburgh Wiser Simulation Fellows. Work in Cambodia has also included collaboration with the Ministry of Health on the development of standards of practice for nursing and projects related to infection prevention and control that have been funded by GIZ out of Germany. In Bhutan, anesthesia workforce was expanded with the implementation of a bachelor's degree in nurse anesthesia and supports for students that were in the certificate programs in Bangkok. This picture shows Bhutan trainees with Dr. Tosh at the Siri Raj Simulation Center in Bangkok. HVO also developed an anesthesiology residency program in Bhutan. Bhutan anesthesia residents are often supported by WFSA for the third year of their residency training that takes advantage of the BARTC program in Thailand. In northern Laos, with input from Craig McLean from PGSSC, HVO developed a nurse anesthesia program at Lao Friends Hospital for Children in Luang Prabang that is recognized by the International Federation of Nurse Anesthetists. Future projects with the president of the Lao Society of Anesthesiology and other faculty at the University of Health Sciences in Lao include an assessment of the anesthesiology residency program at Mahasat and the reopening of the nurse anesthetist program at the University of Health Sciences in Vientiane. It is a pleasure to be able to present to such a prestigious group. Thank you. Thank you very much, Richard, uh, and congratulations on that work and the contribution you're making. And also uh, to, to Annie uh, for sharing, reminding us of the importance of pathology. And if anesthesia is the invisible uh, partner, uh, you wonder whether pathology is the invisible, invisible partner, because uh, so often we forget that we can't uh, have the right treatment without the, the right information and the right diagnostic. So, I think that's a very pertinent reminder. The, uh, we, we've been hearing in this session about uh, the importance of uh, the various stakeholders from the public to the patients, to the providers of care, to the policymakers, and to the politicians. Uh, but we haven't yet heard from uh, the, the, the pharmaceutical and private companies uh, that actually uh, the ability to practice safe surgery and anesthesia uh, and obstetric care actually depends. And we're only going to have one representative, but I would like to invite Ashish Kohli uh, from Johnson & Johnson uh, to give a presentation. Wonderful to meet you all. My name is Ashish Kohli and I lead endomechanical platform for Ethicon, part of Johnson & Johnson Medical Devices Companies in Asia Pacific. As the world's largest and most broadly based healthcare company, Johnson & Johnson is committed to using its reach and size for good, striving to improve access and affordability, create healthier communities and put a healthy mind, body and environment within the reach of everyone, everywhere. 
For more than 130 years, we've been blending heart, science, and ingenuity to profoundly change the trajectory of health for humanity. In 1887, Johnson & Johnson began manufacturing the first mass-produced sterile sutures, catalyzing the start of modern antiseptic surgery. And ever since, we've been innovating to introduce solutions that help surgeons achieve safer and better clinical outcomes, and patients heal faster and become healthy. Also, integral to our legacy is our contributions towards advancing access to essential surgery. Johnson & Johnson is taking collaborative action to provide training supplies, increased advocacy to build surgical capacity, enhancing the lives of millions of people across the globe who lack access to essential surgery. In Asia Pacific, we work hand in hand with community organizations to help advance maternal health and reduce infant mortality. We have also stood at the front lines of change with Operation Smile for more than 30 years helping children with cleft condition receive access to life-saving and life-changing surgery. And in the face of unprecedented change, we respond by pushing for progress. Our Johnson & Johnson Institute has transformed the way we deliver continued surgical education to healthcare professionals through digital channels, making our reach and impact greater than ever before. As we move into 2021, we are continuing to innovate and push our boundaries, extending access to education to surgeons and healthcare professionals when and where it's most needed. We are also helping physicians in India receive hands-on training through our Johnson & Johnson Institute on Beads, traveling more than 50,000 kilometers thus far to support the next generation of healthcare. With our credo at the heart of everything that we do, at Johnson & Johnson, we believe that good health is the foundation of vibrant lives, thriving communities and forward progress. And I look forward to discussing this further with you today. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, uh, Ashish, for that uh, nice overview and uh, some provocative uh, questions and topics uh, for, for discussion. Um, the, this is the time when we get to discuss what we've uh, heard. And uh, there's an opportunity to put that either into the chat or into the uh, Q&A. Um, one of the questions that I see in the Q&A that, uh, that caught my eye is the question that relates to uh, measuring impact and outcome in maternal care. Um, and I think it would be good if uh, one of our obstetric colleagues were to speak to what advice do you give, what partnerships should be built upon measuring outcome with appropriately simple tools or complex tools. And could I ask while uh, someone is deciding who's going to answer if the panelists would please put their videos back on that would allow the all the attendees to see them and whether or not uh, Dovi, Dr. Ravi Chandran from Malaysia would like to to speak to to that question that Adrian's asked Dr. Ravi Chandra you're still on mute I'm sorry okay can you hear me now yes you can Yes. Right. Greetings from Malaysia. Now, uh, I think to that question on outcomes, I think what's very important is we need to have some robust data. If you do not have data, then it becomes very difficult in times of intervention we want to suggest. So it'll basically be trying to throw a stone and hoping that it'll hit the bird. So what we have done in Malaysia is actually we have started a national obstetric registry way back in 2009. And till today, we have about 1.3 million data sets that I'm very willing to share with all the participants here to see how what data we have can help you with your problems and see, because we are a developing nation. And over the last 10 years, we have circumvented certain issues that are very, very, like I see in the question in the chat, there is a question on how to reduce maternal mortality in Nigeria. I think we have some excellent experience that we can share, provided we have a certain specific platform in which we can share these uh, experiences that we have gathered over these years. So without data, and we will be actually very difficult to move forward. Having said that and done, the Malaysian experience in this pandemic has actually given us 
two bright spots. One, we have found out that district hospitals can be used for training, which initially we did not look at all because our patients couldn't move. So we have had people going there to provide the training. The second thing that we found out was a lot of our protocols can actually be modified and become patient-centered and patient-empowered, especially now with IT becoming more and more important. And I think this will actually help us a lot. And the third thing that we have found out is that by pro providing adequate care and training, we can actually make unnecessary surgery less. So global surgery will be there, but maybe the number of surgical interventions actually you need will be less. Example, you can have less third, fourth degree tests, less extended tests, if you know exactly know how to do the obstetric procedure correctly. Thank you. Uh, Could I also ask the obstetricians uh, present whether or not uh, there are key KPIs that you would recommend uh, to measure the success of an NSOAP, uh, the combination with surgery and anesthesia. For example, uh, how you look at mortality rates, as was being mentioned by the Solomons. But could we just, you know, the Lancet Commission recommended six surgical metrics of which the volume of surgery, the, uh, the workforce, the access to surgery within two hours for a cesarean section, uh, the perioperative mortality rate, and some financial uh, ones as well. But uh, are these the right ones for obstetrics and gynecology? Are the things that have been missed out, are the KPIs that we need to be measuring? Thanks for the question. Look, it's um, KPIs are helpful and it's, it's a useful tool, but uh, it's also, as mentioned, the, the data is only good as the data you can collect to then um, analyse con in comparison. And a lot of low and middle income countries find it very difficult to collect um, correct uh, and adequate data. I think the other thing that's, um, you know, the most important uh, operation that we do as obstetricians is a cesarean section, uh, as well as manage um, PPH that would be the two, two main um, surgical procedures that um, we do to uh, improve maternal, both out, um, mortality as well as near miss um, and morbidity associated with a significant PPH. The other point I just wanted to make um, and um, leading on to what Dr. Ravichandra said is that also it's multifactorial to reduce maternal mortality. You need to look at the, the whole picture uh, and also um, access to contraception uh, is one of the, the factors that we often discuss in the Pacific. Um, and so, you know, if, if there's an unmet need for, need for family planning, then there'll be unwanted, unintended pregnancies um, that lead to um, the maternal mortality rates. So it's very multifactorial, as well as not only do you need access to surgery, you need access to blood and you need a blood bank with pathology and you need access to sterilized um, equipment. So you need a sterilizer to be working and maintained. Um, and so it's a, it's a, it's a big picture multifactorial um, uh, approach to, to address maternal mortality. Um, but Amanda Novahill might want to add anything more to that from Fiji. Uh, not much more, but there was something that we'd um, in the obstetric uh, clinical service network meeting that we had last week. Um, one of the things that we discovered was in our different centers in Fiji, we are looking after patients, but the way that we're collecting the data, the standards that we're using are all slightly different. And so therefore, if we wanna talk about national information, we, we have realized that we need to ensure we're collecting it the same way. So just within your own countries, within your own systems, if you can make sure that the way you collect your data is standardized, it's probably going to be a little bit more robust in, in that regard. To some extent, I think, Amanda, you've just you've gone a long way to answering the question I was going to ask. I was going to make a comment to uh, Dr. Ravi Chandran's comment about reducing the amount of surgery and say the medical futurist would say that the future of surgery should be medicine and that ultimately there'll be no need for, for any of us. But uh, I, I was going to ask if there is any an international agreed template that countries or regions could adopt for collecting the sort of data that, uh, that's being discussed in relation to uh, obstetric and maternal uh, mortality? Uh, well, in terms of uh, maternal mortality, I sit in the global uh, WHO task force for maternal mortality. We actually have a template 
for maternal data collection as well as how to report maternal deaths. And that can easily be accessed and can be shared. And I'm always available for anybody to contact me and I can put you in the loop. It's available. You, 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 I, I think we all appreciate uh, that offer. And I think we appreciate the offer you've made of sharing data. Right. And I would ask your advice and the input from the panelists and how do we get every country to be willing to share data? Because that, that is a way of leveling the playing field mm -hmm. uh, without playing the blame game of trying to hide the data or blame somebody. It says, here's a problem, help us work together. Let's build a coalition to address the problem. How do we get other political leaders to do the same thing? Well, that's a tough one. But that's why I'm asking you, sir. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it, it, you see, in, 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 in Malaysia, it took us a little bit of time, but we need to have the political will and a local champion. I think that's, that's something. And we need a common platform where sh data can be shared with total anonymity. And if, we can get, if this can be that platform, then maybe this would be the nidus on which we can build this up. We can start with non-controversial data first and then look at other things because you do not want to point fingers at anyone. Could I ask uh, if Bill Tangy would like to comment on getting, achieving political will, uh, given his experience as a Minister of Health and also as a Deputy Prime Minister in Tonga? Thank you very much, uh, Professor uh, Wallace. And uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers who's listening to um, excellent presentations today and all of them. Uh, the speakers and all the, the partners. Now, I, uh, I've said in, in, in a few meetings, David, about the issue of political leaders. There's so many a time we, I, I for, for your information, I, I was, I'm a surgeon and I was uh, uh, at the political level for some years. Now, before I was a minister, you, you talk about the political leaders as a different group. They are there. They are out there um, in the office of the minister and the cabinet and things like that. And we are here in the hospital and, and, the, and, and in the community. Uh, but I always think and I always thought that our, our, our the performance Many a times, the performance of our leaders depends on the, the le level of knowledge they know. And sometimes we, we think that somebody become a minister or a prime minister and is expected to know everything. It's not happened that way. It's not happened that way. They perform according to what they know. So David, as, as you remember, I, I keep on saying, it is our role to educate our leaders properly. It's, it's, they are not opposition. They are part of, of the team. And, and uh, it is our role. And sometimes, uh, David, I, 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 I blame ourselves for this. Our leaders not knowing enough because we, we we act as if they are supp supposed to know everything once you pick up data. But to answer your question, the thing to do, we must take time, educate our leaders, get them to understand this issue of, of um, ENSO. My minister now was he's only appointed 18 months ago. And it was my role to take care aside and talk to her very clearly, PowerPoint presentation, and now she's, she's taking the lead in the, in the Pacific. So that's my uh, comment, David, thank you very much. Thank you, and maybe could I just follow up uh, your answer with asking Berlin Kafoa to uh, just comment on how 
successful we are being across the Pacific with the various country leaders in, in that education that we should be providing and what we could perhaps do to have more opportunities to educate or educate in a better way. Thank you, Prof. I think the bill has provided the answer. We just, uh, we've been lucky that we have leaders like him and uh, others on the uh, webinar today who have led the way in educating the ministers, even at the regional level. So we've managed to get in a presentation with the appropriate documents to the Pacific Health Ministers who then endorsed it. I think as I, and then the RCM and World Health Sem, all those forums. I think the, from once the leaders are, are on par, they then come back to us and say, uh, okay, help us deliver this. So I think with the key partners, we really have to get a piece of the pie. So to just give you an example, uh, Australasian College of uh, surgeons uh, have partnered with us to just um, deliver online training for perioperative nurses. So again, you've got the NSOPs, now what to do as, as the NSOPs get built up? How can online training for the perioperative nurses at a certificate? At our level, we have to be also diplomatics and why the certificate level so that we don't compromise our own institutions uh, Fiji National University in the region and University of Papua New Guinea. In the meantime, we're answering that questions, how can we train our health workers given the time of COVID? And therefore both partners have gone on to sponsor 36 nurses from the region to take perioperative post-grad courses with the Australian College of Nursing. So very in, in brief, the leaders are there. We bring it to their knowledge and once they no, the question is then how do we deliver the little piece that we can as part of the bigger ends of picture? Inaka. Thank you. I, be I believe Dr. <coughs> Margaret Terreri wants to make a comment uh, as well. Thank you for allowing this opportunity to share one or two obstetric experience. Also, I'm acknowledging um, Rex. And Harvard Medical Institution for the support with the ends of development. Um, Vanuatu is one of the um, South Pacific Island countries, which is um, located west of Fiji. We have a population of 280,000 people scattered over 82 islands um, and six provinces with two only two referral hospitals, one of which is Villa Central Hospital, which uh, uh, we do over 3,000 deliveries per year and a cesarean rate of about 7.4%. Uh, perinatal mortality rate of about 28,000 with a maternal death rate of about 800,000. So as you can see, these figures um, are considered high, but um, that will be improved with improved maternity services that we are currently doing. Our team um, here in country have uh, National and uh, staffs and doctors as well. The challenges that we have are basically the same with the uh, Solomon Islands presented by Dr. Lian's video. The challenges of human resources, infrastructures, governance issues. Um, lately, in the past five years, we have uh, uh, there was a telehealth service called the Vanuatu and telemedicine and learning. And they've only set up in one of the provinces up in the northern region, <clears throat> established in two clinics. The good thing about it is they're connecting them, remote health workers to specialists who are at the national referral. Great. Thank you. Uh, Annette, I see you've got uh, your hand up. Uh, thank you very much. I just wanted to um, speak to the different ways we could educate going forward. We were very familiar as surgeons and hands-on people, perhaps the anaesthetists were too, of being in the room with the people we were trying to teach. But we've really had to have an enormous shift in our, well, actually the way we train for ourselves using simulation, but also teaching online. And I think there is 
uh, just incredible opportunity going forward to having split faculties across different sites and having, um, you know, some faculty in one country teaching some students at that um, level and other people linked in with an educator or, or not at another site. And we've done that w late last year. We did that for an APLS called Advanced Pediatric Life Support between Australia and um, Port Moresby. And it worked like a dream. The local faculty really ran it without much support. Um, but we had faculty on support in Australia um, to back them up. And um, that really was capacity building. I think it's a little bit like when you're trying to teach people to drive a car. You can't actually keep doing it for them. Uh, I think there's a great opportunity for us in the region. I think one of the potential uh, uses or advantages of online, particularly with pre-recorded material, is when you're dealing across languages. Mm -hmm. uh, at a live session, somebody for whom English is not their first language has one shot at hearing what's been taught. Whereas when it's a pre-recorded, available Hello? online, frequently they can keep going back can you hear me? and re-listen. Somebody is wanting to speak. I think it might be Margaret. Margaret, are you back with us? Sorry, go on, Adrian. Uh, I, I was just making, a, I guess, a quasi editorial comment to the advantage of uh, online that I think many of us have ignored over the years is that uh, when, when you're not dealing with English as a first language for those that you are teaching, um, that there is an advantage to having recorded online sessions and that they can keep going back and replaying it till they've actually understood what has been said. And I'd be interested to hear from the participants, the panelists and the participants who, who've had that experience. Richard, for example, in uh, uh, Laos, Cambodia, um, what, what is your sense of the live, we teach you one time versus the potential for, you can keep listening to it online? Uh, yeah, that's a, a, a good point. And we've tried to provide some uh, online teaching. We have a program that we actually use in the US called Apex that we use for them. Uh, and actually our students don't like that program as much as they like Khan Academy because they keep going through Khan Academy and they can understand the language a little bit more. So that would validate that uh, a little bit in the sense that, yeah, they've, they've transitioned a little bit to to some of those other uh, educational programs. What we have found that's interesting during the pandemic uh, with our, not only with our, our anesthesia providers, but also with our nurses and our physicians at Lau Friends Hospital for Children, is that with having fewer volunteers there, it actually has pushed them to uh, be a little bit stronger, quicker. And we found that surprisingly, they've, they've really taken off in terms of their abilities without having so so many volunteers supervising them. So that's been one plus that we've had with the pandemic. Just on the subject of online support, mm -hmm. uh, could I just ask Interplast again to uh, perhaps comment on the education webinars that you've obviously run a lot in the last year. Have you been doing any online support of actual surgical procedures, given that you haven't been able to visit the countries with people perhaps you've previously trained? Michael, you're still on mute, I believe. Sorry, I was trying to use the space bar trick, but it doesn't work, of course. <laughs> what the short I answer, David, is, is yes, yes. Um, we've done multiple one-on-one -on -one <clears throat> case conferences to plan procedures and support clinicians, and also unit uh, case meetings, some of them regular, like with Lambassa Hospital in Fiji, where they have a regular case review session with, with the Interplast clinicians. Just on the remote learning, many years ago, before the current coup in uh, Myanmar, when they, they still had a, a military government, I was asked to, by the University of Yangon, uh, medicine number one, to set up a, what they wanted was a train the trainer program. They actually gave me the words. And they wanted us to train a group of their general surgeons to do plastic surgery and teach them how to then teach the locals. Well, that's now progressed to the stage where they've gone from three plastic surgeons to three plastic surgery units. With the uh, last time I was there, 
two years ago, there were about 30 trainees. They were, they were graduating people with MSs and PhDs in plastic surgery. Um, so that was a very effective form of, of distance education. I, I, I see two uh, hands up. Uh, Ram, you first, then Wayne. Uh, thank you very much. And thanks everyone for the opportunity here. Um, I just wanted to build on what Annette said and said that we need to embrace technological advances as well. So we've been running a national surgical training program uh, since COVID, putting laparoscopic trainers into people's and surgical trainees' houses throughout Australia. And we also are running a pilot in Myanmar before the unfortunate turn of events there. And this means that with motion tracking, you can actually teach remotely laparoscopic skills while they've got simulators in their own houses. And this is a, a highly accessible way to do, and it's actually not that uh, expensive anymore. Technology has advanced that we can now do this. And it's not such a big uh, jump to then that we could use this in the Pacific Islands as well to teach surgical skills remotely uh, and combine that with educational programs, with webinars and other interactive educational forums. So I think the paradigm shift and technological advances we need to embrace as well, because if I can teach laparoscopic skills up to someone in Darwin when I'm based in Melbourne, I can do it in the Pacific Islands as well. So I think we should change slightly our shift of what we do in terms of embracing technology at the same time. Thanks, uh, important points, uh, Ram Wayne. Thanks, Adrian. I, uh, I, it's really good to hear about these experience, positive experiences relating to virtual education. I think we're all on a very steep learning curve with this and the COVID-19 pandemic has really forced us to think of new ways to educate people one of the things we've found at the WFSA, because we've had to put a lot of educational projects on hold, is that it does take a lot of resources to convert existing educational programs to virtual programs. And I don't think we should underestimate the amount of money and other resources required to do this. I think for a lot of people, it's the perception is that we can just take existing lectures or existing teaching methods that we use for face-to-face -face learning and then just just do a powerpoint or, or film ourselves using those materials but to be really good virtual education materials is a lot of resourcing required and they need to be developed in a different way thank you I invite Frank Piscianeri to maybe comment. Uh, Frank is a director of surgery at the Canberra Hospital and with ANU and his experience in both Africa and the Pacific. Uh, th thanks, David. Look, uh, fascinating um, uh, session today. I've been a bit out of the loop in that I've been working with the Surgical Education in Australia, but um, uh, through the Royal Society of Emergency Surgeons, I've had contact with my colleagues in, in my network in some countries. Look, I, I think we really should start focusing on where should we go from now. Uh, with, with lots of resources available, but um, I, I'm not sure if, um, if there's an appetite out there or if it's already been done. But I think the next step we should do now is perhaps do a, a sort of a quite a, a rigorous needs analysis around the world in, in the middle of income, a lot of income countries to work out where, where they're at at this stage, where they want to be. And what are the steps to get them to that stage, and and then um, and then that group then work out a process using all of these resources we have to get there. Uh, I, I think there's a strong need for an international surgical curriculum that's modular based, and then each country can then pick and choose what aspects of that curriculum suits their needs. And I don't mean writing the content of the curriculum; I mean defining what a curriculum is. Then linking resources, such as the resources we've heard about today, and then enabling um, those resources to be linked in with, the, uh, with assessments and giving people the opportunity to, to see how assessments are done in other countries. And then at the end of the day, we have to how do we make this thing sustainable? And there have been good models around the world of sustainability, and that it's mainly using a local partnerships between the, uh, the recipient, the recipients. And, uh, and the providers. I, I, I think we're, we're at that stage now because otherwise we'll have lots of little projects going on all over the world 
But uh, if we can link up all that good work together, I think um, a lot of good will come out of it. Thanks. Uh, I think Ashish, you have your hand up. Unmute. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Adrian. And I would just like to add upon the shift we have seen <clears throat> in professional education over the last one year. So we have various brick and mortar in training institutions across Asia Pacific, where we used to uh, work with surgeons on hands-on training. Uh, with COVID, we've seen a massive uptick in the virtual uh, education space. Now, where we are now experimenting is how do we take the uh, proctorship online? So you can do a coordinated movement between a proctor and a, a trainee surgeon. So if we put our might and efforts behind, I think they, this space will give us the maximum reach and access. And, and this is another area where a lot of uh, corporations can come and join hands in terms of either developing material, uh, translating it, or even coming up with certain modules which can help us reach out to the areas where hands-on training would not be possible for uh, coming few months as well. Ashish, let me, let me follow up on that and just ask you, do you think uh, corporations who are really interested in selling product and making money would be willing to make educational material that was product neutral? So Dr. Aiden, there is a lot of effort that uh, corporations do in terms of creating the material around surgical evolution and the new technologies as well. So there may be a component around the products as well, but largely it's around how surgeries are being done and making it simpler. So dividing the module between residents and advanced surgeons as well. Uh, case in point, uh, we are seeing from Asia Pacific perspective, uh, newer surgical modalities coming up. Now, can product and procedure be bifurcated? The answer is yes, but eventually you'll need products to perform some of those surgeries as well. So I, I still see a win-win proposition out there. The, the other question I was going to ask you was uh, to pick up on a word you actually used, but other people have used as well, and that's affordability. And one of the challenges in low and middle income countries and some high income countries for that matter, is the cost of technology and in anesthesia, it's technology and medications. I guess for all of us, it's medications as well. And one of the struggles seems to be persuading industry that they could lower the cost, make it more accessible to a far, far bigger uh, user market and still make a profit. And industry consistently, in my experience, wants to keep the price as high as possible while still accessing a global market. Is there a way we can sell that proposition to industry so that we can make technology available to low income or low resource countries much, much faster without them actually having to look to the World Bank or other agencies to bankroll very expensive equipment. And I can tell you on the medication side, to some extent, it's the opposite. Almost all anesthetic medications are now generic. Uh, the profit margin for, for many companies is so low that they can't be bothered to sell in countries. So we have no anesthetic agents because they're too cheap. It's the other, the other end of the spectrum. Can you give us any insight into how to make the pricing appropriate for the end user, not necessarily for the producer and shareholders? Thank, thanks, Dr. Adrian, for this question. And, and from Johnson & Johnson's standpoint, we are deeply committed to the cause of advancing access to essential surgery. Now, we are also committed that all our products are available at market appropriate price points. And we are actively engaged in strengthening our manufacturing footprint within the region as well focusing largely on the localization efforts as well so that we can ensure the products are available. Now, one of our imperatives also is that we are invested in solving unmet patient needs and complicated disease problems as well. Uh, to the extent we have very significant investments in R&D and around innovation. Now, there are various partnerships which we are looking within the region on both cost and delivery model. Uh, and I like to quote here our ongoing partnership with Monash University to work on reducing maternal mortality due to PPH. So we lose uh, more than 60,000 lives per, per annum due to PPH every year. And while an intramuscular or intravenous injection of oxytocin is the current standard of care recommended by WHO, 
accessibility to quality oxytocin in resource poor setting is limited so as these products require supply and storage under refrigerated condition to maintain high quality trained personnel to administer we are working on novel methods to uh, work on the inhaled delivery of a powdered form of oxytocin which can simply be administered without refrigeration so these are some of the ways where we are trying to uh, solve the cost problem at the same time we are investing to uh, uh, resolve the unmet patient needs as well so it's kind of a fine balance where the objective is to reach out to as many patients as possible thanks kiki you have your uh, hand up yes so i was just writing in the chat book about um some thoughts but i guess more crucial for our partners and for all of us is the governance that we talked about some time ago and Anita alluded to this in their talk um we talked about governance at the ministerial level which bills actually pay attention to and that's crucial but how about there are partners within our colleges actually having board members from the pacific participating at their level of governance as opposed to the ongoing divide that we have of talking separately and coming together because i think consistently at the at the head of the organizations the combination of the partnership needs to be raised to the governance level if we're serious about it and it reduces all the disparities and miscommunications and the multiplicity of the duplicate things that we do so i thought i thought i'd bring that in and maybe the partners could respond to some thought around that whether it's in the plus with its um the college with any college uh, the anesthetic surgery pma all these sort of uh, colleges who contribute maybe some thought around that thank you well i would Yeah, go ahead, Annette. Thanks. Thank you. Um, so we've restructured in global health at the College of Surgeons, and we have called for um, clinical leads from the Pacific and PNG and the other countries that we work in Southeast Asia to participate with us. And it's my vision that they'll be participating in what's now called the Global Health Program Steering Group. And on that group, we have um, four counsellors, myself from Global Health. Well, we have representation from education, um, the professional development, so that's for the consultant level education. We have the counsellor representing professional standards and the counsellor representing the fellowships. So I think it, at that point, with the involvement of the clinical leads, you've got four counsellors, um, and I think that would be the level, Kiki, that it would work best at because they are the links back into council. I think our council table couldn't cope with all countries being represented at the council directly. Can I can I just clarify that? Sorry, can I just punch in with that? I think in terms of governance and people in the bodies, the Pacific actually has a way, despite the 22 countries, have a way of actually nominating somebody if we want to take it to the highest level. So it's not the issue about what are 22 people coming on to our board um the pacific is very small it's very close and they work together all the time and they will actually be able to do that thank you can i raise another issue which would be about uh the uh, the ability of us to have more online diagnostics any uh one of the most frustrating things uh when you're a surgeon or any practitioner in a low middle income country is you may be able to do the surgery but you don't know what surgery to do because you don't know what the pathology result is um so are we uh, now focusing on the um uh frozen section or uh or aspects of um pathology that may uh, benefit from the help of ai well what oh, i'm because- actually saying in 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 a country like papua new guinea you can wait six weeks to three months to get a histology result. So mm-hmm. I don't think we necessarily need to have a result on the same day, but a result within a week would be very helpful. Um, this is a um, very serious uh, problems in many areas. Uh, for example, um, a, just a, a couple of years ago, I went to Cambodia uh, for a, uh, a meeting that is organized by the International Academy of Pathology. Um, 
Um, I am sorry to hear that uh, at that time, which is just a couple of years ago, I don't think has improved a lot. There are only six pathologists in the country. So uh, you may, and there's no, um, no uh, facilities for say reporting renal pathology or just cervical cytology. I would think that um, a possible, um, possible uh, uh, approach can be of two folds. One is that um, to uh, channel these uh, samples to a uh, nearby pathology lab that can, uh, they're willing to help at a uh, cost that is uh, affordable. Um, that is, uh, of course, the cross country transportation of pathology specimen needs to be uh, endorsed. Another way is to uh, facilitate, uh, is to um, use the uh, AI. Um, so if possible, uh, at these um, countries with uh, lack of um, pathologists, we can just um, provide the, uh, the, the, the basic uh, equipment to tissue processing, uh, produce the paraffin block and the staining. And then with an imager to scan the slice and um, so that the images can be transmitted to uh, other laboratories who are willing to support. And this can provide um, the routine reporting that you mentioned, uh, not so late or even frozen section. Uh, for example, even say in the States, there are some um, states that is very vast in the desert and the university hospital can do the frozen section when the small towns who can afford uh, a surgeon, but not a pathologist, they just have a technician to um, uh, let the pathologist see the specimens and then um, cut at their uh, instructions and then provide the, uh, the image of the sections. And I, I have uh, actually uh, seen that and I think it's quite satisfactory. So, I mean, uh, either there is a, um, a uh, laboratory that is nearby who are willing to accept and report uh, at, uh, at, and pull samples from all these sc uh, scattered populations. The other approach is to uh, use uh, the artificial intelligence more openly. And so uh, I think this can serve the, the, the purpose more. And in fact, uh, this, um, the Lancet Commissioner on Diagnostic, we have just finished a report and, uh, which is accepted. And uh, so it, it is going to be published pretty soon, but uh, I'm sorry, I can't share the um, data because of the embargo issue, uh, but it's going to be uh, uh, published very soon. Um, so uh, hopefully, and actually this uh, paper on uh, diagnostics uh, cover various aspects of pathology and laboratory medicine, as well as radiology, which is uh, very important for, uh, the, uh, for, for uh, disease screening, early detection, monitoring, and uh, management. Uh, Berlin, would you like to uh, comment? Yes, just to quickly comment that the pathology issue, I agree, Prof. Waters has been an issue in the Pacific. We've tried with our colleges, but I want to relate this to the trade talk earlier because when we approached Australian trade, they quickly came up with three companies who could provide. So the business sector quickly responding to us, but it's very early talks. And we want to, we will go back to the College of Pathology to see which ones are the best options for which country. So all I'm saying is sometimes we have to go outside the health to find the solution. Secondly, in the Pacific, for many years, when we see the trade agreements, it's always sad to see that health is not in the big trade agreements. And so we miss out on, on the big discounts, the quotas, etc., from big trade companies. So at the forum level, we continuously see the trade agreements being done, but health is not included. So I just wanted to share that, that in the regional forums, national forums, if you advocate, trade could be part of the big trade, health could be part of the trade agreements that get you a preferential service. Thank you. 
I, I'd like to draw the uh, panelists' attention to the uh, questions that are both in the uh, Q&A and in the chat. And given that we're uh, starting to run out of time, if there are any of those questions you would like to comment on, now's your moment. W one of them that caught my eye was the issue of uh, disaster response and how that fits into the ENSO planning process. Uh, I wonder if there's anybody from uh, the Pacific region who would like to uh, speak to that issue. Come on, Basil. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Kiki. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Always. Um, I just wanted to um, add here, uh, the Emergency Medical Teams uh, is an initiative by the WHO that we in the Pacific have found uh, dramatically changes our response uh, to cyclones. And so um, I just wanted to focus the discussion perhaps to include, as we're discussing with pharmaceuticals, with pathology, uh, with infrastructure, with uh, medical supplies, I think um, uh, a disaster risk management component to it, uh, having a pillar in there for NSOPs is critical, especially, well, I, think, I think we all uh, agree that it's critical to include that in the NSOPs going forward. All of our efforts uh, in the Pacific, for example, would be um, destroyed in a couple of hours with a category five cyclone. Uh, and, uh, and that would probably set us back five, 10 years. So I think um, I just wanted to uh, raise that point that um, there is a place for uh, this collaboration with WHO and the Emergency Medical Team Initiative and the EMTs that are already based in the 15 Pacific Island countries and that is underway. I think there is an opportunity for collaboration, uh, sharing costs and possibly uh, avoiding duplication of our efforts because uh, emergent, national emergency medical teams definitely in, uh, play an important role uh, in our NSOPs going forward. Thanks. Thanks very much, Basil. And uh, I think that uh, that's probably very important for us to remember in our NSOP planning, and we'll uh, take your advice on hand and all the countries will. Uh, I think, as Adrian says, we're pretty well out of time. And so I would like to ask uh, John Mira. Uh, to uh, sum up for us uh, our discussion today on partnerships. David, thank you very much. And, and Adrian, thank you as well. And thanks to all of you, amazing, over 120 people that were on this Zoom for uh, over two hours or just about two hours. So, uh, you know, about two weeks ago, I, I guess, Key, Key asked me, he said, you know, I just have a, you know, small favor to ask, it's nothing big, you know, maybe in three minutes or so, can you kind of wrap up all three of those sessions and, and maybe give an overview of everything? And I said, sure, yeah, how hard can that be? And so I was listening just today and we had 17 speakers and then an hour of really remarkable discussion. Um, and, and it dawned on me, there's no possible way I'm going to go through 17 speakers and give you a summary of everything. And so. That's the bad news, but the good news is it dawned on me from listening to this last two hours and also the first two sessions, how far we've come in the last 10 or even five years. You know, think about all of the, you know, quote stakeholders as Paul Farmer was talking about in his early talk there that we've had over the, these three webinars, WHO, World Bank, Ministers of Health, the Pacific community, GFF, all the professional organizations, the research organizations. You know, this, I, I don't think this was possible some number of years ago. And so I, I don't think that we're really um, you know, neglected anymore. And, and I feel like as a community, we've come together tremendously and, and that speaks to uh, the nature of our partnerships. And for today, I, I think I'm gonna touch on what I heard from two people in particular, because it. It um, is a theme that, that ran through all three sessions. Uh, Berlin made a comment that the objective is safe surgery, not you know, recognizing your own particular organization. And, and that ethos really came through today for me. And, and I think 
all of these organizations feel, feel that way. The other thing I'd say is about Paul Farmer's talk. So he, he spoke very briefly, but he used a couple terms that are really important. He talked about novel partnership and patient accompaniment. And that term may have washed over you, but for Paul, the, the term accompaniment has a very specific meaning. It comes from liberation theology in Latin America from the 50s and 60s. And accompaniment to him and to partners in health means that you work with a partner and you walk with them and you live with them for a long period of time in, in good times and bad and sickness and health, so to speak. And it might not be as formal a relationship or a partnership as a, a marriage, but it is sacred. And, and Paul thinks about accompaniment in a very sacred way. And so when he used the term novel partnership and patient accompaniment, the, the novel part of that is that the, the partnerships that we're creating, as you could tell from the speakers today, are in the true spirit of accompaniment and they, and they are longitudinal and, and, and I would use the word sacred. Uh, I wanna cover two more things in closing. One is the NSOAP process itself. A week ago, the Prime Minister of Fiji opened up the NSOAP meeting and that was a remarkable meeting. And you look at all of the stakeholders and you look at how they led that process. And, and I would add all the Pacific Islands because Fiji I think was the, the, the first to have this type of a meeting but they've all made that commitment. And that commitment that the Pacific Islands made and that Fiji has demonstrated in that first meeting, that's really the way forward. And, and you've seen something similar in the Sadiq region in Africa, but that type of commitment to a multi-stakeholder uh, partnership and communion is, is where we need to go. Uh, the next related thing is when you look at what Wipro has, has done, and I'm going to put something in the, in the chat room here. That is the resolution that was passed at, in Wipro in the last regional committee meeting. And I see that as a very significant document. It calls for Wipro to do a number of things. Um, and it, and it, uh, it asks for Wipro over the next really nine years uh, to make a commitment to national level surgical strategic planning. And so I guess the question I would have is how do we replicate this? How or how does this get replicated in other regional offices, for example, how, how can something like this happen in, in Sierra? Uh, because that's a profound commitment. If you look at the last page of that resolution, it calls out the three or four things that, that uh, Wipro is meant to do. And then the last thing I'll talk about is funding. So a week ago in that Fiji meeting, um, Minister Wonga talked about something that has happened here in the US and that is the, the 2021 US Appropriations Bill. And that shouldn't mean anything to many people, but what I will tell you is that USAID has never before been able to spend money on surgical system strengthening. And that's because there was never language in what's called an appropriations bill. And so due to some tremendous advocacy work by Lismore Nebaker from Mobile Surgery International and G4, G4 was very instrumental in this. Uh, they've actually changed the law in the US. So now USAID, for example, has a legal mandate uh, to, to support surgical system strengthening. And I'm actually gonna put that new law in, in the chat room there as well. And page 43 has some very specific language. Now, the reason I bring that up is for the first time ever, ministries of health can now go to USAID, for example, with their NSOPs and say, look, we need help with this. And this is now a congressional mandate. And you'll see on page 43 that it specifically mentions the concept of surgical strategic planning. That is a monumental shift in US global health spending. So I just bring that up because if, if countries and ministries don't, don't realize that and are not aware of that, they won't be able to properly ask for that type of funding. So with that, I will thank everyone. Uh, I wanna thank, uh, I wanna thank uh, Key and the team that he worked with. So Rennie and Sangchul and Zach and Anusha and Michaela, many of you met them. They were behind the scenes really uh, uh, working so hard over the last really couple months in planning for these three sessions. 
And uh, thanks also to all the panels and speakers. This was a huge commitment. Um, three of these meetings, two hours each time at all sorts of different hours all over the globe. You know, Port Terry Reynolds was up at 2 a.m. Minister Wonga a couple months ago was up at 3 a.m. for some webinar that, that we had with him involved. So the commitment has been profound. So I, I wanna thank everyone. This was a, a wonderful session tonight and a wonderful three sessions over the course of this uh, session of this series of webinars. So thank you all. Thank you, John. And uh, can we everybody just uh, stay on, turn on your cameras for our obligatory picture? Oh, good. The social media picture. Excellent. Yes. <laughs> there it is. All right. So I'm sure our crack team will have that up on, on Twitter and other forms of social media in no time. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks very much. All right. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Yeah. Bye.